Welcome to a Legacy Enchantress video. This is Spatula of the Ages. It's been a little while. I'm going to be talking about basically changes to the deck since whatever my last video was, which was a little bit after uh, the bannings in March, I believe. So since then, the deck has gone a few, through a few iterations. With the release of Kaldeheim, I uh, switched to a bug list that I'm just nicknaming Adelaide. And the reason for that was that I felt like white was no longer really offering very much to the deck. Solitary Confinement is, I think, no longer good against uh, most decks in the field. There are still matchups where it's very, very good, but um, they are fewer and further between generally, or at least they were certainly during this period. Actually, there's been a resurgence of aggro, so Confinement's actually probably a little bit better than it was, but so... Finding the Old Gods uh, allowed me to help maintain enchantment count while being able to have cards that answer permanence like O-Rain. And then like O-Rain and Confinement were really the main things that White was giving you at that point. So uh, that's why I veered into this bug list, uh, running blue for Estrasimication and Riptide Chimera, which uh, Riptide Chimera was actually very, very good, especially against Delver. This curve though is a little bit higher. Uh, you may notice a lot of three drops. But, I mean, this list was fine. It was, it was alright. With the release of Modern Horizons 2, we got Sithis, uh, which has been really, really good. So I was excited about her when she was spoiled, but she actually exceeded my expectations because the life gain was much more relevant than I thought it would be. So, she is a two-mana legendary creature without any kind of shroud or hexproof or any kind of protection, so she is rather fragile. But, um... It's very easy to cash in on her before she dies. If you go turn one wild growth, turn two Sithis, and then another enchantment, it doesn't matter if she dies, she still generated value. So I've actually gone up to four. This was a list sort of more immediately after Modern Horizons 2. So Sithis was very, very good for us. Modern Horizons 2 also gave us Solitude and Endurance. Now, uh, a lot of decks are running Endurance, so that's not obviously specific to us, but both of these worked very, very well with Living Wish, which is a, uh, so this is Witch House. This is the version of Enchantress running Living Wish, largely as a package to both add redundancy to the main game plan, largely through Destiny, Spinner, and Argothian Enchantress, as well as, you know, Doomwake Giant, Sayer Sanctum, and Emrakul, but also uh, offering you a variety of playlines that a normal Enchantress deck wouldn't have access to, such as Game 1, Gaddick T, Caracas, Wasteland, um, and now Endurance and Solitude, which have given you many more lines of play than you had previously. So, so this was a great addition to the deck. Since Modern Horizons 2, because Wizards is just pumping out sets now, there's been another addition, uh, Paladin class from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. So this is a one minute enchantment. It's a class enchantment. So the way that these work is they have an activated ability. The activated ability is to level it up. It's at sorcery speed. You gain the next level. So it starts with, for one white mana, spells your opponents cast during your turn cost one more to cast. Uh, then you level it up to level two, and that pumps all your creatures plus one plus one. Level three is whenever you attack, this is a triggered ability, the first two are static, until end of turn, target attacking creature gets plus one plus one for every other attacking creature and gains double strike. So this card has been really, really solid um, and I'll be showing some examples of its play. It's something that people have asked about and I've just noticed not a lot of people talking about it generally. Like some people like, um, I think it's uh, Joe Dreyer, the, the guy that does the uh, leaving, not leaving legacy, but the weekly legacy articles on MTG Goldfish mentioned it. But um, I don't know what other decks can use this, but for this, for us, this is a really, really strong addition. Uh, and I'll show why in some games. So this list, feel pretty solid about it. I've dropped the Mirius Guile just because of, you know, slots not being available, as well as the fourth abundant growth, but we still have 19 one drops, which is a good amount. We still have a lot of enchantresses, a lot of interaction, and that's pretty much most of what the deck does. It's enchantresses, gas, and interaction until you get to the kill. One change, I guess, uh, one other deck building change to note before we talk about the sideboard is the switch from Elephant Grass to Onthen Ice. Both have their use cases where one is better than the other, but the switch happened largely largely to be able to support Solitude as a Living Wish target that I would be able to, with some regularity, pay the alternate cost for. Uh, so that's the reasoning behind that switch. Um, 
So the sideboard, a few people have asked me about this. So first we'll talk about the board, then we'll talk about actual sideboarding. So these slots are the ones that I consider pretty untouchable. Like these slots are just, these five, including Spore Frog, which many people malign, um, are just hyper efficient mana wise at helping you either set up or respond to situations. These three are just basically extensions of your main plan. These two are your your mid uh, mid game plan. Doom Mike Giant is sort of your mid to late game payoff. Uh, I would always run either two collector oof or one Gaddick Teague and one collector oof. These are against combo, so you have one to Zenith for post game one and then one as a wish target. Pride Mage, always either Pride Mage or Knight of Autumn. Um, they obviously each have different ups and downs, but you definitely want one of them. Tabernacle has been great uh, because there's a lot of aggro, as I mentioned earlier, in the format. And against the Madness deck, for example, being able to, if they go turn one, LED, drop like five creatures into play, you can, you know, Living Wish for Tabernacle and clear the board. It was very effective. Wispmare as a very efficient answer to Urza Saga, as well as supplementing um, Pride Mage in certain matchups like Omnitel or a learn. Emrakul, partially this is to bring in as an anti-mill thing against like Hogak or Painter. Partially this is against certain, in certain board states, you know, you just have the 17 mana and you just need to end the game efficiently. Emrakul is probably the second most borderline spot right now. Heliod, I was trying out, but I'm going to drop him either for Wasteland or playing Engineer at the moment. I'm not sure. Those are the next ones that I want to try out. Wasteland, um, I'm interested in trying now that I have Paladin class because it can help squeeze their mana even further. Okay, so that's the deck list. Quick note about sideboarding because somebody asked in the Discord. So one thing I've noticed when watching other people play this list or similar lists is um, a tendency to think that, that there is no sideboarding because it's a total wish package at this point. However, that's not exactly true. There are many matchups where you sideboard a couple of cards, and there are actually certain matchups where the Living Wish has come out completely and you just board into a different deck. For example, uh, any deck that's trying to squeeze your mana, Death and Taxes or Lands, well, Lands, it really depends a little bit actually. But Death and Taxes and Maverick, any kind of like random stacks deck, Moon Stompy or Dragon Stompy, whatever you want to call it, as well as actually I will side out the wishes against Delver if I am on the draw against them. Also, certain decks, like, um, for instance, if you're not running Wasteland and you're up against 12 post, I'll side out the Wishes because that matchup is just uh, a goldfishing race. So you just need to be as hyper-efficient as possible, uh, and you don't have any bombs against them, really, that you're wishing for. So let's go on to the actual game review. So game one, match one. Our opener is uh, a little risky, right? We've got a non-wasteable land and what acceleration and an enchantress and then a bunch of redraws so if we find a second land in the next couple of cards a solid hand we end up keeping it so opponent leads on tundra generally that is good news for us most tundra decks are pretty favorable ponder into a no shuffle but you know they are blind so that doesn't necessarily mean anything we found another land it is a non-basic. Generally, Tundra decks aren't going to be running Wasteland, although they could be main decking back to basics, of course. Okay, so it looks like Bant Stoneblade now. And they it looks like they're going to have a fast clock here. So we draw Paladin class. Absolute lead on the Wild Growth in case of back to basics or any other shenanigans. They could be on Wasteland if they're on uh, Stoneblade into Abundant Growth, into Paladin class. And the reason that I do this is because we only have one Enchantress. So I would really like this to resolve. So I'm playing the Paladin class out in advance to try to increase the chances of it resolving next turn. Okay, they miss a land drop. They don't Cauldra. They ponder into a Shuffle. So we know one card in hand. They probably have a force here, um, but we did draw the other land. So what we can do, well, I guess we could have done this without the other land, but we can lead on Paladin class number two. They only have one mana open. They have to either force this or they won't be able to interact for the rest of the turn. And we can cycle an Abundant Growth off the Enchantress. All right, I'm gonna press play for a second here. See, look, so 
opponent giving us information. Uh, we suspected they had force of will. They did. Okay, that's a pretty decent draw. That's a less decent draw. Now we are only down to one enchantment in hand. But we do have an enchantress. All right. Um, so the big fear would be three mana into Narset or something, obviously. Especially since this is not a creature, so we couldn't pump it with Paladin class and get in there and kill Narset. Oh, that would be... Well, yeah, they couldn't drop Cauldra and Narset. Um, they just dropped Cauldra, so it's the beginning of a clock, but it's uh, it's pretty good for us. So we've got three cards to find some more enchantments, and there's one, two, three, there's a bunch, so this game is pretty much over at this point. Um, even if they, at this point, drop a Narset or Hull Breacher, we've got multiple answers. Um, I play a Heliod here, so I mentioned in the Discord, and actually I think I mentioned at the beginning, Heliod is, uh, was a flex slot. I wasn't happy with him, so he's going to go um, possibly either be replaced by Wasteland or by Plague Engineer or Grist, the Hunger Tide. I'm not sure. This game is pretty much locked up. It's hard to imagine what they could do here that would put them back into the game. Yep, yeah, nothing. So we're up against Bant Stoneblade. Sideboarding for this matchup. Um, so the question when sideboarding is what are you going to wish for and how deep do you want your Living Wish bench to be? Um, you want it to be pretty deep against Stoneblade. It's a fair deck. It can go grindy. Now they could be running an Aethersworn Canonist, in which case um, that does make Living Wish more awkward. But generally I would say that the wishes stay in. And you want a fairly deep bench. What I would do is just take out, I think, like a wild growth, maybe an abundant growth, just to bring a little bit more density in for threat density, that is, for a, uh, a destiny spinner and endurance. Um, oh, this is the, uh, <laughs> that's wrong. So it should be. Uh, For this, um, actually, did I bring in a Pride Mage? I don't think I did. I think it was like this. Okay, so let me go to game two. So we keep a hand that has acceleration, redraw, uh, some interaction, some anti counter. It doesn't have an enchantress itself, notably. Um, but we could cycle this. We can draw off the abundant growth. And we are running. In this list, um, let's see, we're running four Presence, four Sithis, three Argothian, two Green Sun Zenith, and four Living Wish. So the odds of us finding another Enchantress at some point in the next two turns is pretty reasonable. Okay, so I lead on the Paladin class. Rather than the Wild Growth. Now that could hurt us if we draw an Enchantress's Presence or a Green Sun Zenith, but um, I'm not expecting to, to rip that blind. This sets us up next turn to go um, Abundant Growth, possibly Cycle if we need to, and I'd like to have the Paladin class in play early. Okay, the Nature's Claimant, um, not a card I was necessarily expecting to see. So I haven't drawn another Enchantress yet. I have to hold on to the cast out for the moment instead of cycling. Uh, because we still have another redraw here and the draw for our turn. They bounce back our acceleration. It's not a huge deal. They did draw a card off of it. Okay, so once again, we are not finding Enchantress. Let's thin the deck a little bit, redraw. Play the other Paladin class. And hope to draw an Enchantress for the turn. Uro is not so scary. That could have been, you know, something much more terrifying like a Narset or a Hull Breacher. Instead, they play an Uro into two untapped mana. Okay, we draw an Enchantress. I'm going to go for it. They have the Force of Will. 
They're down to two cards in hand. So this next turn is going to be really good for them, though. They've got an Uro in the yard. The fairy's going to uptick to three. And they're going to play a Stone Forge. And they get Sword of Earth and Home, which is not a normal card. A card you normally see, rather. Um, so I guess it's relevant against us. Those are our colors. Um, the effects aren't super scary, but they will be able to get more equipment with it, obviously. So I guess that's the real threat. So here we have a decision point. We can either cast out one of these things because the Teferi is going to bounce one of them. We could, for instance, cast out the Uro. If they bounce it, we could play it again next turn and they would lose their Uro or at least go to the graveyard, but they would draw a card off of it. So I decide we need to cycle our cast out and hope to draw an Enchantress. They are tapped out and we have Paladin class in play. So if we find an Enchantress in the next two cards, we can get back into this game. I don't think casting out one of these three threats is going to put us back into this game, though. So we cycle, find the land, and there's the Enchantress. Okay. And there's another Enchantress. So I have to draw the cards while I can, so I'll cycle that first, turn that into two more cards, and it's two more Enchantresses. So, um, so that's interesting. They decide to... Um, that was a blind terminus, so they decided to just... I'm pretty sure that was a blind terminus. Yeah, that was, right? Because last turn, turn they Uroed, and they played Stoneforge. So that was a blind terminus, and they decided to cast it. I don't know if that was correct or not. Because um, they obviously also had a significant board. But they're hoping that we don't have any more enchantresses at hand. But we do. They tap out. With one card in hand. So we need to draw... We'll have one card draw off the Zenith into Enchantress because we drew a land for the turn. It's another land. So let's level up our Paladin with the extra mana. There's no reason not to. Hope that uh, we dodge any kind of Narset effect for another turn. Okay, it's a Batter Skull. That's not so scary. Then at this point, we have not that many lands left. I just want to clear out what we've got. All right. So, um, we can actually kill the Teferi now, because we have On Thin Ice and our Argothenus pumped from the first Paladin class we played. So now, uh, now I think we've dominated this game. I don't think there's much they can do at this point. Even if they had a Narset or a Hullbreacher here, uh, it wouldn't really matter because we've got Double Paladin class and Destiny Spinner. We've got Lethal on board. I'll just play the third one to take out any chance of interaction that isn't completely free. So that does leave Force of Vigor on the table as the only relevant card they could be playing because um, Destiny Spinner stops forces and we're not going to cast another spell anyway. So that should be all she wrote. They can't sort the posture as the attacker. And that's it. So now we go to match two. We are on the play this time. So we have turn one acceleration into a turn two enchantress. It's not um, what we'll call the good start. That is a two mana enchantress plus a cantrip. But it's pretty solid. It's certainly not mulliganable. We will lead on Utopia Sprawl. On the play, I'll always lead with Utopia Sprawl over Wild Growth because I want to get the white on board, especially in the current version that is rather white heavy in case of something like Chalice of the Void. On the draw, if we're against a blue deck, I would actually lead with the Wild Growth because if it gets dazed, it's more expendable than Utopia Sprawl is. So we are against a uh, Delver deck we can assume, well, we actually can't assume that. It's Volcanic Island, Dragon Island, that could be a number of things. 
but most likely it's either Delver or some kind of standstill deck uh, that's becoming popular. Either way, we'll lead with Paladin class into Destiny Spinner. This way our Enchantress's Presence is pretty much guaranteed to um, resolve next turn, right? So if they have to dig for an answer to Destiny Spinner, then they... So if they have a Natural Bolt and Force of Will, um, then we're in trouble because they can um, clear the Destiny Spinner um, and then I still have man open for a Force of Will against the Enchantress's Presence. But the number of cards they need at this point to disrupt our Enchantress next turn is um, it's a pretty specific set of cards. So they brainstorm, and they don't find the answer to Destiny Spinner, which is great news for us. That means they don't even get to attack because we've got a 2-3 against their 2-1. I'll lead here just to set that up for the future because we've got extra card draw off the Abundant Growth, and we know that this is going to resolve. Um... So they clear some cards that they brainstormed away. They play another creature. They still are not able to find the Lightning Bolt. So this is really good for us. We still have our Destiny Spinner. They haven't been able to get any mana advantage off of the Ragavan or cards. Um, we are pretty much free to go here. Fortunately, we don't... <coughs> We don't draw any more gas to play, but uh, our situation looks pretty good. Even if they finally find removal this turn, um, we've already established a pretty strong board here. And we're at a high life total as well. So this one, uh, it's going to be very hard for the opponent to get back into it. They did find the Lightning Bolt. I don't know why they um, did what they did. They attacked before Lightning Bolting, letting me prevent the Ragavan hit. Maybe... They thought that at this point they're far enough behind, maybe they agreed with me on that, that they need me to make a mistake in order to get back in the game. Um, a mistake like blocking Dragon Rage Channeler and giving them a free kill um, that is letting them uh, get Delirium and basically just get a free kill against the Destiny Spinner and still have the Lightning Bolt. Um, that's, that's the only thing I can really think of for that decision. We get Sarah Sanctum because we have a lot of cards on hand, but our mana's a little bit tight. We drew all the high-end stuff. We'll go for the Doomwake here. If it resolves, it's great. Uh, they can force a will it. They have a mana open and a Paladin class. They do. We still draw a lot of cards off of it. We get to thin ice something. I'd actually rather take the Dragon Rage Channeler. The monkey's actually not that great against us. There's also the problem, like, if they have another monkey, it's sitting in their hand being useless, but um, if you clear the monkey, then it's uh, it's basically like you wasted a card. Um, and the Dragon Rage Channeler is clearing away the cards that they don't want to draw, which is probably a lot of cards at this point. Okay, they did Wasteland us, though, and they monkeyed away our other Sarasanctum. So no more Sarasanctum until we, uh, unless we shuffle this back in through Endurance or Emrakul. Which I believe is what we're going to do. So we draw a bunch of cards, we gain some life off of Sithis. There's a monkey. They're very low on resources. So at this point, it's a matter of being able to execute our finish. Okay, so they did have a force negation for our third living wish. So we are down to one wish left, which is a little scary. Um, because there, there's a Destiny Spinner gone as well. So our number of kill conditions is actually kind of low at the moment. So we'll just cycle through the deck for the fourth wish. We will wish for Emrakul, move to discard, um, and the opponent will concede there. So the sideboard against Delver when I'm on the draw looks something like this. I take out the wishes because of days in Wasteland, you know, constraining our mana as well as the castouts because they're also very expensive to actually do anything besides cycle. Bring in another land. It could be the Sanctum. I've been trying the Caracas, you know, just for the monkey and the fact that it also works well with Sithis. 
uh, solitude and endurance. Um, both being able to be free can be relevant when you're really tight on mana against a fast clock. The other enchantress, the destiny spinner, and the doomic giant as a sort of end game plan. Um, there have been times I've actually brought in Emrakul just because lately a lot of the UR Delver decks are running Court of Cunning in the sideboard, which is kind of scary, actually. So just as a way to deal with that card specifically, but I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless you've seen Court of Cunning. So we're on the draw. We keep a hand that has some risk to it, of course. It uh, once again doesn't have the second land and has the two expensive enchantresses. Um, it does have a bunch of mana acceleration as well as two paladin class. I keep it, but it's it's kind of borderline. It, it's quite likely supposed to be a mulligan, actually. I'll lay down wild growth in case it gets dazed, like I said earlier. Although there there's a real debate here because if we don't draw that land, we could double spell next turn with paladin class utopia sprawl if the sprawl resolves. But that's actually even more of an argument for wanting to try to make sure the Sprawl resolves by waiting to see if they have days. Okay, they blind flip. Pretty scary. They miss a land drop, but they do have a Delver. Okay, we draw um, a land, which is great. This was a mistake. Against Delver, you should stack your land enchantments for the reason that they could be running Winter Orb. Um, so I should have put this Utopia Sprawl over here, actually. Um, again, I'll be leading on Paladin class, which is another risky thing because they do have a fair amount of pressure, but um, they also missed a land drop. So if we can constrict their mana, then next turn we could be in a good position. Okay, they found a land drop. They ponder. They didn't shuffle. Uh, they opt to get rid of our Paladin class, so um, what I'll do here is they, they Prismatic Ending our, our first Paladin class. I'll play the second one out in front of the Enchantress because I don't want to commit three Enchantress, three mana to an Enchantress that's just going to be countered. It gets countered instead. Um, I will, they, they're down to one card in hand. I'm going to lead on um, Zenith over Enchanter's Presence, because this is our only enchantment left. I get Argothian, but it's a close call. There's a serious argument for getting Sithis, the argument being, you know, we're quite low on life and they have two Delvers in play. But I also just don't want this to be removed with their last card. Okay, they didn't flip, so we got lucky again. Now they've got three Delvers. Pretty scary stuff. Okay, that's a great draw. We will lead on the Enchantress's Presence. They've got one card left. They could have a Daze, but, or Spell Fierce as possible, I suppose. But little else that could actually interact here. Okay, another Onthanice is a fantastic draw. We'll get the Flip Delver, obviously. We'll go to eight, which is, of course, scary. But they don't actually have any red mana right now. And they are, of course, on Jeskai Delver, so, um, you know, if they draw red cards right now, they can't cast them yet. Okay, we got rid of two of the Delvers. One left. It doesn't flip. Okay, we do get Wastelanded. But we've got a Sithis in hand, and it's going to draw two cards when it comes down. And then there's some gas, so it looks like we're going to get this game at this point. Some more gas, Destiny Spinner in play, and we'll be gaining life off of the Sithis. So uh, we're also getting outside of, you know, Bolt, attack into Bolt range. Just get rid of a bunch of fetches. They scoop at this point. Uh, they've got zero cards in hand, a Delver, even if, fli if it flips. Um, they just don't have a way to get back into this game at this point. Okay, we are on the draw. So I remember this name, Swampy Swamp, as a combo player, just like when you grind leagues, you tend to sort of associate people. Sometimes you're incorrect, but my memory is that this name, I, I feel like, is a combo player. Um, 
So I keep this hand, which is pretty questionable and kind of slow, because it has Living Wish, which is our best bet game one against combo, um, which is still not a great bet. So clearly the chat is just like bugging. This is from different matches. Okay, so they went underground C, underground C, uh, Street Ray, Thoughtseize, Ponder. So we know now that this is Doomsday. Um, sorry if I went through that, but you know, I didn't actually have that many decision points uh, up to this point. So they opted to take the Destiny Spinner, which is interesting, instead of the Living Wish. The reason they would do that is if they don't have the combo immediately, if they have the combo immediately, Living Wish is the only thing they can interact with them. If they don't have it immediately, Destiny Spinner presents a clock. So it seems like they're more scared of the clock, uh, which is good for us. Um, it means that, you know, we have a chance to get in this if they can stumble on their combo for another turn or two. They're at quite a low life total already off the street race, Thoughtseize, Spetchlands. So we drew a bunch of land, unfortunately. So we don't actually have the green card to alt cast Endurance, but they don't know that. When they Thoughtseized us, I think there's either two or three unknowns. So what I, it's important maybe not to hesitate, um, just so, you know, the opponent doesn't think you're taking a chance here. Just go for the, uh, I just go for the Zenith here, looking for a Destiny Spinner, they force it. Pitching a Thassa's Oracle, which means that they definitely run two. That's also information we can glean from that. Um, but that's good for us. I'm glad that they're spending their resources countering our stuff. So we have Endurance in hand. And they just concede, which is very interesting. I guess their hand was just rubbish. Um, we do have the Endurance in hand, but we don't have anything else going on. I think my sideboard looked something like this for this matchup. Uh, obviously the O-Rains are pretty useless. I board out one on Thin Ice. I leave the others in just because they're cheap. Cyclers with an Enchantress out, and I take out one Presence just because it's so much mana versus a deck where you need to be pretty quick. If it were against Oops, I probably would just take out the Wishes completely and hope to draw, naturally, the Endurance, um, aggressively mulligan into it. However, against Doomsday, they're not always a turn one or turn two deck, so, uh, although we did see a bunch of Street Reds, so they are the faster version of Doomsday. But, um, but we're going to hope that they're not so fast that we can't live in Wish into Endurance. So that's going to be our sideboard plan. So... This hand I keep just based on the fact that it presents a fast Enchantress into drawing cards. Um, and I'm just hoping that they've got a slightly slower hand. Uh, but we don't really have, you know, the luxury of mulling into turn one interaction, which is what we would have needed here. They had turn one Dark Ritual into Doomsday. So that's going to be pretty much it. I am going to go ahead and see about... Obviously, looking at how they sideboard it, looking at their deck. Um, you know, so we get to find out. It doesn't look like they board it much, um, which is pretty reasonable. So we don't really get a chance to get into this game. They take away our cards. We try to play some pressure, but it's way too late. All right, game three. We're on the play. This has turn two oof, uh, which is probably the best we can reasonably hope for, except for um, living wish into endurance. But this could slow them down, and it presents pressure. And then a follow-up Gaddic Teague, which could be more pressure. I brought in Gaddic Teague. To my knowledge, it only stops Force of Will, but um, 
<laughs> it also beats her too. We just don't have much to do against Doomsday. Uh, it's not a matchup we're trying to beat. It's an incredibly unfavorable matchup. This list is really just trying to consolidate the good matchups and just take the losses for the bad matchups. I got pretty lucky here, however. So they take away the Gaddic Teague, which I think is interesting instead of the uh, Zenith. Rather than lead on an Enchantress, I'm just going to Zenith for Destiny Spinner because, in my opinion, the only thing that matters here is presenting pressure. The more pressure I can present, um, first of all, it means... Um, it obviously reduces the life total post-Doomsday, but it also means... Um, you know, it limits their ability to street wraith, wraith their way into a one-turn win off of a Doomsday. So at this point, you know, they would be Doomsdaying into seven life. Uh, we found the land, which is really lucky. So now we get to attack, and now we drop them to seven, so they'd be Doomsdaying into three life, which is very tight for them to try to win in one turn. Uh, I'm sure it's possible, but, um, okay, they thought this Oracle, and they set up the Doomsday, so we already know that they have two Oracles, so clearly this one is, um, trying to, uh, just block the Elemental and absorb that three damage, so they'll be at two instead of at one, where they couldn't cast Doomsday, um, however, um, so, so we draw on Thin Ice, which is interesting, because we could animate and attack, or we could take it out of the way and attack. Either way, we get the same amount of damage through I, on Thin Ice, just because there is the off chance that they boarded out the second Oracle for something else. And, you know, I, I could have drawn a card off of that. There was no reason not to place it this first, I suppose. Okay, we drop them to two hope that they can't do it in one turn. They'll be at one life. They just had it too slow, it looks like. Yeah. It's a bad luck on their part. Alright, we are on the play against an unknown opponent. So this hand has the good start, right? Turn one, Utopia Sprawl, we'll name white, into turn two, Argothian, into Abundant Growth. Very strong opener. Certainly against any kind of fair deck. And then back up Enchantresses and back up Interaction or Enchantress if we need it. Volcanic Island into Ponder. Unsure what this could be at this point. There could be a lot of things right now. A lot of Volcanic Islands floating around. Another Ponder into Fetch Land into a preordain. So preordain could be a couple things, but double volcanic island with such aggressive cantripping without trying without playing a threat or leaving your mana open really suggests that this is probably blue red sneak and show. We have the cast out for the um, show and tell. So we need an answer to sneak attack. They force a will it. We didn't have the ability to play Living Wish into Caracas again. They had another days for the second Enchantress. So they are going to show and tell here. We have the cast out. Unfortunately, they get Grizzlebrand into play. So that's going to be the best thing against the cast out. Because they still get to draw the cards. Um, they are at three life. But um, they've also drawn quite a number of cards. Okay, they opt not to force the Enchantress, which is unfortunate. I was hoping to buy a force there. Yeah, saving it for the... Uh... Okay, now we've got a bunch of lands anyway. And here they will sneak attack. Let's do Lotus Petals. To an Emrakul. And a... Crystal brand. So that's going to be all she wrote. We could have survived a single one of those, actually. Like, we could have sacked, you know, this Dead on Thin Ice, um, an Abundant Growth, some other cards. We wouldn't be happy about sacking all this to an Emrakul, but we wouldn't be dead. And uh, it's possible that they could whiff on a couple turns, or we could find an answer to Sneak Attack. But that didn't happen. The sideboarding looks something like this. They're not attacking our mana in any way except for um, 
possibly Bloodbound, and the black isn't relevant at all. So I'll take out the Abundant Growth, um, they're fairly expendable here, and one Enchantress, because we are definitely the, uh, not the beatdown here, we don't necessarily need huge threat redundancy. And I'll bring in Emrakul, because it can be a good um, thing to have in hand when they play Show and Tell. Pride Mage, Gaddick Teague is a way to get try to get him out early and put him, uh, have him block Sneak Attack. Destiny Spinner just to help our stuff resolve and present some pressure. Our main wish targets are going to be Solitude, Caracas, and Wisp Mare. Okay, we've got a strong start here. Again, we're not worried about Wasteland or anything, or else this would, uh, against an unknown, this would also be a mulligan. But we know they don't have Wasteland, or at least we can safely assume so. So we've got the good start and a cast out in hand, so that's a very strong hand. And another Enchantress. We'll lead off with the Bayou, because if we are going to lose one of them, the Bayou's the one to lose. They could have um, Blood Moon, which would suck, because we would also lose our Utopia Sprawl. But uh, I'm not going to be too worried about it. They force the Will, our first Enchantress. Um, I'm going to keep the Abundant Growth to have something to cycle off of the Presence, assuming that that resolves next turn. Does. Let's draw some cards. Okay. We need to find an answer to sneak attack. We've got show and tell covered. They now know about our hand. They have not to uh, hit the windswept teeth. Maybe they just figure we've got enough mana at this point anyway. I have to keep cast out open rather than play the paladin class. Because um, because we don't have any other answer to sneak attack right now, and you just want to be careful against sneak and show that deck can just have it out of nothing, like alchemy. Okay, they do have a sneak attack. They don't opt for the attack. Uh, my hand's a little forced here. I'll try to get rid of this sneak attack. I keep drawing lands. That's unfortunate. We can cycle these. But I am going to uh, try to thin first. We have Zenith. I'm going to get Gaddict here to shut off future sneak attacks, force of wills, things like that. Um, and pump him so that if they have Pyroclasm, which they often do, they can't just pyroclasm him away. It's also going to present a reasonable clock now. And that's actually lethal. Um, the Destiny Spinner, a great draw there. Just make an enormous double striking, let's say, planes. With Trent. Okay. Got that one. On to game three. Okay, we are on the draw. I keep this hand, it's kind of iffy. Honestly, I probably should have mulliganed. It does have the potential for the good start with a lot of redundancy, but it really needs that land. Up oh, most to five. Okay, we found the other land, so... Decision rewarded. This hand is now very good. Assuming that they don't just turn to us. So you do not have anything to put into show and tell that is comparable to a Grizzle Brand or an Emrakul. Okay, I have to get some mana out because we've got plenty of card draw. Okay, that's fine. Um, I didn't. I wanted to draw the card is why I led with the um, Enchantress before the Paladin class. I didn't care so much if she got countered because we've got another one. Same reason here. If they want to force to foil the Sithis, um, they'd be down to one card. That's fine by me. At that point, we would just shift into Destiny Spinner Beat Mode with Paladin class to pump. I'm digging for something. There it is against uh, Show and Tell. Let's attack first. Take them out of double Grizzle Brand draw. Gaddick Teague, and I think they missed land drop here, and that's pretty much going to be game then. Uh, I don't... Do we have lethal here? We do. I think we have exactly lethal. 
Yes, we do. We have exactly lethal. Alright. Okay, we are on match five. Yes, I would like to play first. So this hand can't cast any spells, unfortunately, because of the basic planes. Uh, this hand is a little slow, but it does have a lot of threat redundancy. So we hope we're against a fair deck, or a deck where the Thin Ice is going to carry a lot of weight. I'll get rid of one of the Enchantresses. We've already got a couple. Just lead on Prismatic Beast to pass, because that could be, you know... Most likely band control. They go Island Ponder. Into Shuffle. Because they didn't lead on a Tundra or a Volk, I'm okay just running the Sithis out into potential removal because they would have to spend their next turn doing it. Um, I suppose if they're tapped. What I mean is um, they don't have like an untapped ability to just kill it on our turn. So they'll at least have to spend mana on their turn to do it. So I'll take the chance. They don't have removal. Uh, we are able to keep our Sithis for turn, cycle off of her, play the other Enchantress, which is meant with a Force of Negation. So that's a little scary because only Enchantress now is quite vulnerable to removal. We do have an Abundant Growth for Redraw, and if it looks at this point like we're up against some kind of miracles. Um, and these Thin Ice are kind of awkward, especially game one. They don't have that many great targets for it. Uh, the Synthesis resolves. We are able to draw a bunch of cards. So now things look a lot better. Um, I'll just play the Empty thin, thin Ice just to cycle it. We do have Destiny Spinner and Oblivion Ring. They've got a Counterbalance, which is interesting. You don't see that much anymore. They reveal a Force of Will off of the Counterbalance. So we know that we're pretty good to go. Although they will have Force of Will coming up soon. But let's get our Destiny Spinner down now, so uh, that blanks their counters. Unless, of course, they have Swords of Plowshares. I decide to clap, uh, level up here and just kill the Teferi. Take that off of the board. And then let's try to Oblivion Ring the Counterbalance. Okay, now we know they have a Force of Will in hand, which is a dead card now, unless they have removal. Uh, and that one went pretty smoothly. Uh, so we'll go to board. So my memory is that this is how I boarded. Thin Ice post-board does have more targets. It's quite possible they could bring in Hullbreacher, other Sworn Cannonist. Uh, they could have Monastery Mentor, but Thin Ice can be pretty awkward at times. So I'll trim one, trim a couple Wild Growth, and uh, bring in Pride Mage since we saw Counterbalance. Endurance is just better as a surprise thing against Fair Decks than it is... Um, as, you know, some silver bullet you're getting, as compared to, you know, Doomsday or something. And I'll bring in Gaddock Teague. Gaddock Teague is pretty good as, against Miracles right now, because they're running more Jace now that Oko is gone, and they're also running Prismatic Ending, which is an X spell, so Gaddock stops it. Okay, game two, we are on the draw. This hand is missing the second land, but it has a lot of redundancy, Paladin class is going to be very good in this matchup. It has O-Ring as removal for any problem permanence. So it's definitely keepable. We'll have at least two draws to find another land. There's another land. Or Living Wish. So keeping land light hands is more viable in Witch House than normal Enchantress because Living Wish can become land if you're just drawing a bunch of top end stuff and no land. Especially against a deck that's not running Wasteland. So they let us get Sithis, we draw off of her, she eats a sorts of plowshares, that's fine. Canonist. That's an awkward card. Uh, pretty good against us, much better against us than Deafening Silence is. We do have the Zenith for the Pride Mage, that answers Canonist, if it resolves. Looks like it will. Canonist isn't completely free for them, though. It certainly makes cantrips much weaker, right? If they're going to cantrip, that's their spell for the turn. Uh, I would not have blocked here. I would rather deny them a turn than um, an optimized turn than, you know, save the two life. I don't really care about that much right now. I'll go for a Sithis, since we draw that, and to a Paladin class. And unfortunately, I believe here we're going to meet a Hull Breacher. So that's very awkward. 
Now we're down to three cards in hand. We have Living Wish. We can find Solitude and try to kill this Hull Breacher. It resolves. One of these three cards weren't Force of Will plus Blue card. Prismatic Ending. Okay, so we don't have an Enchantress. We have a Paladin class in play. We're both low on resources. We do have a redraw. Let's try to redraw. They are telegraphing hard that they have a whole breacher here. Um, that's the only thing that, like, they're not going to force of negation of the abundant growth. They have a whole breacher and they forgot about Paladin class. Uh, so that's really unfortunate for us. We can try to um, play around it, <laughs> but we haven't got much going on anyway. So we'll level up the Paladin class. Counterbalance is also annoying. Zenith is a great draw here because we know about their Hull Breacher. They have the four mana now to pay for it. Uh, they might as well have just done it on their turn. They've really lost the element of surprise here, but that's fine. Um, we're going to Zenith now for uh, something that's not an Enchantress. Um, I think I end up going for a Destiny Spinner. There's a serious argument for Endurance. We saw in game one a Snapcaster pitch to force... And they're low on resources, so Snapcaster is one way to get for them to get back up in resources. We need to go into beat mode. That's our only real chance at this point, since we don't have an answer to the whole creature. I'm just going to play this out to make our elementals bigger next turn. They have not a whole creature here. Snapcaster, unfortunately gets back sorts to plowshares and um, that puts us in top deck mode. Hull Breacher comes into play. Their hand is empty. We do draw a Living Wish so we can try to find another Destiny Spinner. Unfortunately it gets hit by the counterbalance. Um, so pretty unfortunate. Uh, they'll shuffle that away, get back Brainstorm. No, Ponder. It's strange that they got back ponder over brainstorm given that they've got counterbalance but so we are at a high love total they don't have tons of resources in hand we can try to get out of this no nope. level up we kind of need to draw something this turn and then not have much else going on in order to try to get back into this and even then it's not very likely This is just a 1-2 with Shroud. I guess it trades with Snapcaster. We need to top deck a sequence of cards that involves us being able to actually use this Argosian. Zenith for a million. Uh, try to. I actually could have done it for one more. I forgot about Terminus as a possible counterbalance hit they could have, but they've got the the next Force of Will. So actually, did they even force that game? Um, well, whatever. They have a counter for it. So that's kind of it at this point. And our our Gothian no longer trades with Snapcaster either. And that's gonna be it. I'm playing this out largely just to make them think that I have more outs to this situation than I do for game three. So this hand has turn one Utopia Sprawl into Paladin Class Abundant Growth. It's got a lot of good cards. It's obviously missing the third mana here, but I'm going to keep it because all these cards are super relevant against them. Okay, we found the land. I'm actually going to lead on the Paladin class anyway. Okay, now I'm going to lead on Sithis. They can't source the Plowshares at this turn. They opt not to force it. 
we get to cash into abundant growth. So now we've drawn a bunch of cards. During their turn, they swords it, swords her, and they drop a counterbalance. Okay, we can double spell. We've got five mana. This is a blind counterbalance. So unfortunately, they also reveal a hull breacher. So they blind hit it, and it's a hull breacher. Pretty annoying. We do get our Destiny Spinner down. Uh, they opt to snap swords, the spinner, rather than play the whole breacher at the moment. Um, we will have the option of Sithis plus Enchantress here, and still have the O-Rain open next turn for... Um, they show an island, so finally they start missing with this counterbalance, which this game and last game got a lot of value. Um, we play some more spells. Now they do have Hull Breacher on our turn open, uh, and they will have two treasure tokens. So our Paladin class, more awkward against Hull Breacher certainly than it is against Narset. Living Wish is a great draw here. They miss on it, because now we can get Solitude. We can actually just hold up Hardcast Solitude. They have Force Negation, so obviously there's a little point in playing this O-Rain uh, for the Counterbalance, for example. Um, a little bit of a waiting standoff here. Um, okay, we found gas, so we will opt to wild growth. It uh, gets hit by the counterbalance. They will opt to hull breacher. I will try to solitude. Do they have horse of will? They will shuffle. They'll miss. All right, I'll get to eat it. And draw a couple cards. Okay, so we have permanently dealt with Hull Breacher number one. They snap into Brainstorm. Okay. Into Tear, our presence. <laughs> a lot of Sithis. So, okay, so uh, I'll talk about that in a second. So, I've gone up to four Sithis because most of the time what I found is I don't actually mind casting a second Sithis into the first one all that much because it usually means my board position is pretty good. And she's just such an mana efficient enchantress that um, that's why I went up to four. I was just very rarely unhappy to draw her. She also like really increases the white count um, without having to play a bunch of suboptimal cards for Solitude. Uh, so yeah, I don't like occasionally it's awkward but generally i think the four is actually the correct number <clears throat> now o-rain was actually a mistake i should have played the pride mage into the counterbalance uh just because o-rain is we know they have at least two hull breacher and o-rain is an, the only answer we have on hand to hull breacher um although you know we've got a few draws but um i still think that was probably incorrect um could have also brought the fourth on thin ice back in now that we knew that now that we knew that they were on uh hull breacher instead of narset but um yeah so those are two uh errors probably so unfortunately for us what we're about to find out is <sighs> we'll lead with paladin class they do in fact have hull breacher number two and they'll have two treasure tokens so they actually have like a force open um I decided not to do anything about this. Um, so what we're going to do here is just level up twice. And now we've actually got 10 points of power going in. Um, so Paladin class both making it more difficult for them to interact and suddenly being a double crusade. Um, and they've just got a bunch of creatures that can't really block super profitably. Our Argothian trace with two Snapcaster Mages, and we still get a bunch of life and damage in. So they Mentor, okay, into Jace. So, you know, this is obviously, most of the time this is going to be a great board for Miracles, right? Hull Breacher plus Mentor plus Jace. Um, you have to assume that they've got a Force by now. Um, however, that Force is going to be dead because they had to play the Jace, and we've got Paladin Classes in play. And we've got a significant amount of pressure, and they're at 11. So there is obviously an option here. 
uh, about whether to attack Jace or attack them. But given their low life total, I'm definitely going to just try to put the pressure on them. Um, because they killed their Argothian Enchantress with the two Snapcasters, they only get one treasure token, so they're still not at a point where they can interact with two Paladin class in play. Endurance is also a good draw here because it's another creature that gets pumped, can be big and scary. Make an elemental and just... So now we've got an 11-11, a 5-4 lifelinker, and a 3-4 all going at their face. Um, so they have to block with the whole team. They can't pump them uh, with uh, prowess because of the paladin classes. So another thing paladin class is doing is making these guys terrible blockers. Okay, and now there are two. And they actually need to just deal with the board. Like, their Hull Breacher is kind of irrelevant now. My board is very, very lethal. They need multiple removal spells or a Terminus, which is what they do. They Terminus here, which kills their own Hull Breacher. And gets rid of their treasure token, which means that they can't interact at all on our turn. And our hand is pretty gas. And they're at one, so they can't force a will, even if they had mana. Okay, they did make a light drop, but they still can't interact. Um, I'll just draw some cards. Draw more cards. I like drawing cards. More cards. Okay, fetch lands are off for them. They don't have Uro because they're on uh, Jeskai. They play a Mentor. They Swords. Whatever, it's fine. Next turn, what we can do is just, you know, clear the board with Dim Wake. And uh, attack for lethal with our growth. Well, we can just lead on the Paladin class, and that way they can't force the will to Dim Wake. Okay, wait, they do have three mana now. No? No, they don't. Okay, so now we can Paladin class. They don't have enough cards to answer both Paladin class number three and Doom Egg Giant. So another nice thing about Paladin class, of course, is that it stacks. So running the four, um, you know, obviously there's matchups where it does very little, um, where maybe the second level is relevant, but that's about it. But against the fair blue decks, which are still at least half the fields, probably more, it's been really, really strong. And it's actually not that bad against a lot of the decks running, for instance, Crop Rotation uh, or Force a Bigger. It just really dampens the ability of the opponent to surprise you. It can force through critical spells. And then you saw in this match, it can also just let you turn a corner much more quickly than you normally could and just get aggressive. And we saw in previous games and matches where it was able to allow us to threaten Planeswalkers that they probably thought were safe because their board was non-threatening. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. Um, hope, uh, hope you enjoyed seeing Paladin class in action. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, it's possible that three is maybe a better number than four. I'm really not sure. Um, we'll find out. It's also been interesting, um, we saw probably a few times this week now, um, how well Sarah Sanctum works with it as a mana sink. And, uh, you know, including against hate that might limit our ability to cast spells. Um, so yeah, I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, if you're on MTGO, you should try it out. You should get paper copies. I think it's going to be a very solid card, especially since this is already pushing us uh, further into white. Um, so, you know, for a while I was thinking white, you know, it was a bit of a weak splash color for the deck, really. But these are two cards that have just been really, really good, and combined with, like, On Thin Ice, um, have given us a lot, and Solitude as a wish target, have given us some cool tools. All right, thanks for watching.